So precision medicine's been enabled by the low cost of genome sequencing, and we now get lists of genes that you have, other people don't have, and that uh, change your risk for disease. And so the question is, now that we have those lists, how do we turn them into something useful? What I'm going to try to do is tell you one or two quick stories of how we can do this in the realm of cardiovascular disease as a proof of principle, and then some new tools I can go quickly uh, that I think will open the door to doing this for neurologic disease in a broad way that we're very excited about. So this guy here is a mouse, and what we used to do uh, to study human disease was use mice, but this is actually a very special mouse because this is the first mouse ever made from induced pluripotent stem cells um, in our lab in 2009. So he's sitting on fibroblasts that are his parents. And we can take these fibroblasts from people, turn them into stem cells, and make copies of your genome, and then turn those stem cells into any kind of cell we want to study what your genome does to the cells implicated in disease. So um, to me, this was a really astounding um, turn of events from a person who'd been studying mice for a long time. And what we see this as here at Scripps is that we form a bridge between the basic research um, in Scripps and STRI uh, to form, uh, allow us to translate the genomic and other findings into disease mechanisms and targets and possibly new therapeutics. So my lab has been investigating ways to improve the technology and use it for a broad spectrum of different disorders. Um, if you could make, uh, investigate a genomic problem using the right cell, uh, the question is where should you start? And so what we asked is what is the actually most expensive piece of your genome for human health? And I can tell you what that is. It's something called 9P21. And this one part of your genome that was found in, in genomic screens accounts for 10 to 15 percent of coronary artery disease incidence and costs us about 30 to $50 billion a year in the U.S. Um, this is all located in a genetic risk region that's very mysterious. It's only in humans, it has no coding genes, and it's very large. So in the 10 years since it was discovered, we really haven't figured out what it does. What we do know is that it likely acts in the vascular wall, and when you get atherosclerosis, what happens is your smooth muscle cells and others de-differentiate and form plaques. This thing's been around for a long time and is not lifestyle dependent. It's even in Otzi, the Iceman, who was found um, under the ice, and he's many thousands of years old. He had the risk allele, and he had uh, signs of CAD. So what we decided to do was uh, know that we didn't know anything and see if we could use genome editing to knock out the whole locus. And this was kind of a risk at the time, but we were actually successful in doing this. And so we decided to take patients who had the disease, red risk, and also were risk, and we took non-risk patients who were healthy, and we made from them knockouts of the um, locus, and then made these cells that were implicated in disease. And what we thought would happen is when we knocked this out, it would be very bad, and it would give us a hint of what to look at as the difference between a risk and a non-risk person. Um, and so what I'm going to tell you is the cooking show version of this. Um, we did a lot of experiments. It took seven years, five labs, and eight babies were born during the course of this project. Not to me. So, <laughs> um, so, so what did we find out? Um, that this, our idea was wrong. Well, this part was right. The bad cells were different from the good cells, and they looked a lot like the cells that you find in plaques. But when we knocked out the whole region, something different happened. And actually, knocking out the risk region made things better. So there was something bad in that risk region. We figured out what it was. It's a non-coding RNA, which is actually an easy thing to uh, knock down. And that non-coding RNA we showed regulates 3,000 genes, a list of 3,000 new targets involved in these kinds of functions, as well as 38 of the 91 known risk genes uh, for coronary artery disease. So we think it's very exciting that we actually got to a very large list of potential targets for the uh, most expensive locus known in the genome using genome editing of iPS cells. So what about neurologic disease? Um, uh, we haven't, how can I put this? We failed a lot, but we're not going to fail anymore. So um, the problem with neurologic disease is that the kind of neuron you're looking at matters. Stephen Hawking, for example, if you were trying to figure out why he was so smart and you looked at his motor neurons, you'd get the wrong answer. So what the field has struggled with is getting the right kinds of neurons. So a few years ago, my lab decided to try to make um, specific kinds of neurons in an enriched way in a dish. Um, and in particular, we wanted to make them 
so that they um, uh, would be useful for medicine. So um, a couple of students and postdocs in my lab decided that the peripheral sensory neurons that mediate pain, itch, inflammation, and also are uh, selectively affected in a number of neurodegenerative diseases would be a good kind of neuron to try to make. So they looked in the developmental biology literature and they picked out some of these factors, these transcription factors, that can convert cell types from one to the other. And they put them into a dish of skin cells or fibroblasts, and here's a movie of what they saw. You can get these skin cells to actually convert into cells that have neuronal morphologies. And we published this in Nature Neuroscience a few years ago. These cells, then, you can make in sufficient quantity to do screenings for things like the compounds that mediate um, heat uh, and make you feel cold um, and so on. So uh, this was very exciting, and we've been collaborating with uh, people at Scripps, including Joel Gottesfeld, to look at uh, Friedrich's ataxia and others. But we were interested in asking, if we can make a dish full of a very important kind of neurons, um, could we make all the kinds of neurons that you'd ever want for studying any neurologic disease? And as we know, we're getting many lists of genes for diseases like Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, um, depression, autism, and so on. But we, in these cases, barely really don't know which neurons we want. So Rachel in my lab did an experiment um, that said, we don't know what we don't know, so let's just take all the transcription factors we can find, let's screen them all in pairs to see if they can make induced neurons, um, and then ask how many we get. So she screened 600 of these, and we were quite excited to find that there were 75 new ways just from the screen to make these kinds of neurons. And when we looked at their gene expression patterns, we could find that there was a great diversity of genes that might be involved in making many useful kinds of neurons. So I'm just going to tell you <clears throat> one more thing. So when you get these uh, different codes for different kinds of neurons, what you want to know is the neurons you're getting out are the same, and you also want to know how they're different from each other. So what we did is uh, an experiment using single cell analysis, and what we could show is that neurons made with the same codes of different factors actually cluster together in similarity. So when you make these things, you're getting a lot of neurons that are very similar to one another, um, though they have some inherent diversity. Are these neurons different from each other in some way you care about? We then could look at the genes that are distinguishing those populations, and there are many interesting genes here. So um, there's all sorts of disease genes, pressure detection, nicotine addiction, epilepsy, and on the plane today, I found out that this receptor is actually implicated in pathological gambling. So um, I won't present this in Las Vegas. Or maybe you want to activate it. Um, OK, so what about something really big like autism? Well, there are a lot of genes involved in autism. We haven't been able to really link them to a mechanism very well. Here's a paper from Stanford. Um, suggesting that an autism gene shank is actually acting through a um, specific kind of channel that makes neurons fire differently, called the IH channel. So we can look in our code and we can ask, can we make neurons that have this channel and don't? And um, then we can make those neurons that should and should not have the channel. And here's an example. The one that should does have the channel. It makes this dip and the ones that shouldn't don't have this channel. So if this is right about autism, then you would want to study this in patients um, affected and unaffected using this kind of neuron and not that kind of neuron. So we're um, learning quite a bit about how to make better and more specific neurons. Um, so we're really interested in applying this now to these big hit genes, uh, diseases, that have been really uh, difficult to study. Um, so um, I think we've gotten pretty far across the bridge since 10 years ago when we made that, that, <clears throat> that first mouse. Um, and I have to credit the people in my lab. Uh, they won the Halloween costume uh, award for the second year in a row, um, and they were dressed as a spectrum, not knowing that I'd be speaking at this conference. So thank you. <laughs>